right, to kind of understand the absurd story of this whole crazy anything, you got to kind of understand the key players and where kind of their humble beginnings came from. They came from Syria. They were four Syrian immigrants. They settled in Brooklyn. Um, the main father was Sam M. Antar. He believed in good family values. They had a bunch of cousins spread out through the whole borough of Brooklyn. His son, we're kind of crazy how he got his name, is Eddie Antar. He was a uh, no-nonsense kind of guy. Um, apparently, he was a big uh, gym rat, and he also um, was very, I guess, charismatic in a way. Uh, there's a story of him getting a sale. Um, he locked himself, actually, he locked himself and a customer in the store and uh, did not let him leave until he actually made a sale, so he was a real go getter. And then uh, Sam E. Antar, he was kind of the whole brain of the operation. He was a really bright guy. He uh, had Eddie pay for his education. He went to a Baruch College, which is in inner city New York. He had a 367 GPA, passed every section of the CPA exam on his first time. So he was a really bright guy. He was the CFO of Crazy Eddie. That's just a picture of him. That's the father, Sam. He was the co founder. That's Eddie. And there's the other Sam. So just kind of a brief <coughs> overview of the history of Crazy Eddie. It got its beginnings as ERS Electronics. Uh, it was founded by Eddie, his father, and uh, one of Eddie's buddies. Um, eventually, Eddie ended up getting a two-thirds control of it because of a legal dispute with his buddy. So his, he had 30. He had 66 percent. His dad had 33. Um, another key date was the uh, New Year's Eve massacre in 1983. There was starting to become uh, some. They were starting to become a little disdain for the family with each other. And uh, what ended up happening was actually the father on New Year's Eve came out and said that Eddie was having an affair with some lady down in Manhattan. So the family drove to Manhattan and right before a big brawl happened, they all decided to stop and put their differences aside because they were um, in an ensuing fraud case and also the, they had their IPO coming up. So then in 1986, the electronics boom ended, so the family split up with everybody who joined the father's side, and uh, Eddie and Sam were kind of on their own. And then their fa the father gets uh, the family to put blame on Eddie and Sam, and uh, they go to the SEC, and uh, it all kind of went downhill from there. And then eventually in 1987, there was a hostile takeover with Eddie and Sam. And then they found the fraud. Uh, this just kind of sums up uh, what Crazy Eddie was all about. This is a commercial. Yeah. Is it live? Crazy Eddie's greatest TV and video sale ever. Get a video recorder, color TV, large screen TV, video camera, even an audio video component system. Get it all on sale now during Crazy Eddie's greatest TV and video sale ever. Remember, we are not undersold. We will not be undersold. We cannot be undersold. And we mean it. So get anything and everything in TV and video. Get it now during Crazy Eddie's greatest TV and video sale <coughs> ever. Crazy Eddie, his prices are insane. So that just kind of sums up what Crazy Eddie was all about. That's a radio announcer, Jerry Carroll. He was just a DJ up there in New York at the time. So at the beginning, they were just doing simple fraud before they went public. Um, they just skimmed their cash sales uh, to make a little profit. They paid employees mostly in cash. And what they would do was they would give them cash and then pay them a check of like 10, like one employee had a check of $10,000 for like their salary and then their cash they would get about fifty thousand. So they were skimming money that way and then they were claiming giant insurance frauds which helped boost prop boost profits. So then Sam had the idea to go legit in order to prepare for uh, the coming IPO they were having so it looks like they were a good company. And they started paying everybody in check and doing everything right by the books. And then on uh, September thirteenth, nineteen eighty four, Crazy Eddie had its IPO. So we're going to talk about, uh, there's really four methods we're going to cover about how they uh, used, how they committed fraud um, once they were a public company. There was four major things. So the first one is inflating inventory. Um, so 
one of the big issues with this was the auditors throughout the process were really poor in their manner of it. It wasn't very, it was very predictable. Um, and Sam kind of led the auditors where he wanted them to go, which allowed him to do all this stuff. So one of the first things was they only performed inventory accounts in half of the stores, which right off the bat, I left the other 50% of the stores free to inflate however they felt. So um, one of the other big issues was the employees were counting for the auditors. So instead of the auditors going and doing these physical inventory accounts, the auditors would go with the employees and they'd go into these huge warehouses that had these boxes uh, stacked to the ceiling. And then you have uh, the employees climb up on the boxes, act like they're counting, and then they get to a point where they just shout out a prefabricated number to the auditors. The auditors accepted it, and that was the end of it. They were giving them the numbers they wanted instead of the actual numbers that they had. Um, so that led to them reporting inflated inventory accounts. And uh, like I said, the other half of their stores were free to inflate their inventory. And then um, another big one that started in 1986. Now remember, that's when the electronics boom ended, which is a big part of it. Because at that point, they were in big trouble. They were more so like losing money. Um, they needed to really inflate their earnings because they were a public company. And they knew if they reported poor earnings, they were done for. So um, it started with collusion with the vendor, where they would they, um, Sam specifically asked them, called them, asked them, said, hey, send me some inventory before the year end, after the year end, then you can build me some work. The guy was all along with it. So that's what happened. They started getting this inventory up between three and four million before 1986. And it was reported in the first quarter of 1987. So, and then that's where that comes from. And in total, this added up to about 10 to 12 million. So, where it comes down to, the first part is more of the do as I say, not as I do, or not as you see approach. That was a big problem because the auditors uh, could have stopped this quickly, I mean, by literally doing their job. Um, however, as you'll see in a few slides as we get going, that it really wasn't that easy. The auditors were young, naive, and uh, Sam was kind of like their big brother because he was an auditor, and these are kids like us fresh out of school a year and a year. And, uh, this was a guy they thought was very smart and kind of manipulated them. And uh, one of the other big things they did, which isn't really on the slide, but is uh, they recorded inventory that they were returning back to these stores. Um, for some reason, this was never caught. Like I said, once again, it was just a failure to even attempt to inspect. Throughout this, that was, that's the prevailing theme. Is it's not what the auditors did wrong. It's the fact that they didn't do anything in the process. They literally just did as Sam wanted them to do. He was, he was kind of, they were his puppets. So this is uh, one of the big things, the Panama pump. This stretched all the way from the beginning of them skimming funds back in the 70s all the way till the end, um, even beyond when the fraud was over. The Panama pump was still in effect. So why they did this, they needed to meet Wall Street projections. And um, their whole goal, and this one's going to focus on this specific year, but it was to increase sales from 4% to 10%, which added up to about 2.2 million. So the way they worked, they have these secret accounts set up in Israel. These guys were from here that had a lot of family in Israel. So they skim their funds, or however they got their legitimate funds, and they take them and put them in these fake accounts in Israel. The first they'd go to Panama, they'd write uh, bank notes, and they'd get them to Panama. See, Panama and, uh, Panama and Israel both had privacy and secrecy laws where uh, the U.S. couldn't see them, couldn't interact with them. So that was huge that they used these two specific locations. Um, so once after that, this was a big indicator of what was happening. The bank drafts were written 25,000, 50,000, 75,000, and 100,000 notes. Well, what's interesting is the average customer said with Crazy Eddie was only $300. So uh, the other method they used is they put them in U.S. safety deposit boxes and do the same thing with skimmed funds. Then they'd skim the funds, they'd wait a little while, then they'd deposit them as sales. So those are the two parts of the Panama phone. We have the secret account part, and then this. This is going to actually let you see how it works, so I can explain it this way. So you got your dirty money, and then they place it into these accounts. First it would go to Panama, and then they'd send it actually to Israel. But this is exactly what it was. They'd send it there, go through, go through these processes, and then they'd come back to the U.S. as clean money. So that's the way they were actually able to hide it and uh, keep it going. One of the other big things was the debit memos. Um, they used credit memos until 1986, which is basic, which means essentially purchase discounted trade allowances are recorded when they're received, which is pretty standard. It's not really a problem with that at all. Um, 
vendor center sentimental, then they reduced it. Well, all of a sudden, in 1987, Sagan decided to change their accounting policies to go for debit memos. These are the two verbiages, first line of the credit, and this one was the exact verbiage of what he used. Changed the last word, which changes dramatically. Purchase discount and trade allowances are reported when earned, which is huge. So instead of waiting for the vendors, they reduced their account payable whenever they really felt like it and really came down to. Um, ended up uh, doing $20 million worth of phony debit memos. They increased their income and hid losses significantly. One of the big issues with this, once again, was the auditors. Never even verified these accounts with vendors. It was actually discovered afterwards that Sony, which was one of their big um, customers at the time, came to them and told them, like, our numbers are not matching Crazy, Ed Crazy Eddie's numbers. The fact that they were reporting that many of their vendors actually owed them money instead of owing them money. That's how much they were inflating us right here. So that's a huge difference. And another big thing with this one with the accounts payable is what they did trace was it went directly back to Crazy Eddie. There was no external tracing of these documents. There was no external documents to verify this. Everything they did was a big circle that revolved within their own company. <coughs> so the third method of this is a channel switching. So one of the big things to mention is, like that says, needed to inflate comparable store sales. At this time in the 80s, the comparable store sales were used to see sales made in stores operated in current and previous years. So the whole point of this is, we got it, you're making a lot of money if you got 10 stores, but we want to see how consistent your stores are. This was a big Wall Street thing. Uh, the financial analysts love this statistic. So this is really the big thing they focused on, was making sure that the terrible store sales were really good. This led to the channel switching. This is what happened. Their stores weren't doing well. They were opening stores rapidly, which made them look to the public like they were doing well, but they really weren't. They weren't selling anything. So what happened was the main office started selling merchandise to resellers, not to end users. Now that's the point of comparable store sales. What's your stores for selling to your end users? The main office of Eddie, Sam, and their few allies were coming up and they were reselling to retailers, to wholesalers who would then sell their products. The whole thing is they're selling this at cost, which, uh, like I said, it's completely fabricating what the comparable store sales is meant to be. They have a very false impression. So the way they do that, they pay them, then they, um, there was $10 million total they used this for, but then what they do is they take that $10 million and they told these guys who they were selling to, hey, give it to us in smaller amounts, we want a million here, 500000 whatever it is. Then they take those checks and they deposit it in individual stores' accounts to make it look like um, they were legit. One of the things with this too, um, was that the auditors did, once again, the auditors didn't even think to check this. There was literally no invoices to verify that this was happening. If they would have simply taken one trip to the bank and asked for something or looked to see where these deposits were coming from, it would have ended the whole fraud right there. But it literally, once again, comes on the auditors just not doing their job. And uh, who were the auditors? At first, they were uh, him and Horowitz, and this is actually where Sam worked. Um, Sam, <coughs> this was really good for Sam because this is where he attained his CPA license there and he kind of learned all the ropes where he could kind of, you know, get his skimming from and how he could kind of doctor the books up like they did. And then before they had their IPO, they needed to go to a more well-known um, accounting firm so they would uh, sell better. So they went to uh, Maine Herdman. And then after, then a year after that, Maine Herdman turned into uh, Pete Marwick, which is what is known as today as KPMG. And then uh, after the hostile co t takeover came, uh, Tuche Ross became their auditor, and uh, that is who is known as Deloitte now. Alright, so where were the auditors? Like I've said, I've already started to reiterate and quit mind with that. The auditors really were nowhere to be found, but the truth is, um, Sam was the mastermind behind these auditors. Like I said, these auditors were fresh out of school. Mind you, it was 20 years ago. They didn't have a comment in their head like we do about Sarbanes-Oxley. They hadn't seen all these frauds happen today to really make them skeptical. And they were taught it, but they didn't know what it meant. They didn't know the repercussions that could happen if you weren't. So Sam's whole goal throughout this thing was to ensure auditors could not finish all their work. Specifically, this was, in his words, his specific goal was 
that 25% of their audit work completed by the time they were supposed to have 75%. What that meant was, at the time they were supposed to have 75%, let's say they had two weeks, three weeks left, well then these people had to start cutting all these tests stuff that they wanted to do. They had to cut all these procedures that they normally would do because they didn't have, just didn't have the time to do it. So, one thing, crazy idea, pretty women, how did he do this? How did he make the auditors get so far behind? Right here is a huge one. So the young men, all these single young men in their early 20s, fresh out of college, got good jobs. What's he, what's he use? He uses his females and employees to intentionally distract them from the work. This wasn't just a once every now and then. This was literally a constant thing. Pretty much not forcing, but telling his female employees to create relationships with these auditors to the point that they took up almost all of their time every day. They would go weeks, not really get anything done because they were so infatuated. Another thing was Sam uh, would take the senior auditors, the ones who had a little more knowledge, he'd take them to bars with good women, women take them to restaurants, uh, just pretty much flatter them, splurge on them, just make them feel like they was a part of the family. He really started to build that trust with them. Uh, one of the other things was he would have all of his employees. If one of the auditors needed something, his employees took care of it. He treated them like royalty. Like I said, made them feel like they were special. Um, at the same time, he was just blowing up their head, making them, like I said, buy into what he was doing. <coughs> and like I mentioned, this is a big one. He mentored the auditors to fit his fraud. Uh, imagine if you go out there, you don't really know to trust. You're at your clients every day, and this guy's a really smart guy. He's a CEO of your company. Most of the time, you're going to think it's a pretty good guy, take his word for it. He always did it with a smile. Sam never was angry, never got mad at the auditors. He, that was his whole purpose, was um, to make them love him, trust him, and believe him. And so these are some of the things as far as accounting policies. Yeah, we learned them, but like I said, like I showed you that one accounting policy, he made them do it as he wanted. So if they didn't know something, he told them the answer they needed to hear, or that he wanted them to hear, not the right answer. And so where were the auditors? Wherever Sam needed them to be is inevitably um, what it was. Okay, so now we're going to get into basically where the auditors didn't do their job. We kind of touched on some of these different things. But, um, the three fraud conditions, or three things that are present with fraud. Um, so there's the incentive or pressure, and then opportunity and rationalization. So the incentive were obviously um, Wall Street expectations. Um, there was a downturn, like we talked about, in the electronics market, so they were trying to stay above everyone else. And then one of the big problems was, since they matched all the competitors' prices, sometimes their prices were too low. So they weren't big enough like Walmart is to be able to match anybody's prices, but since that was kind of their marketing scheme, sometimes they had to take a loss on certain products that they sold. So that was a huge issue. Um, and they had also just recently went public, so obviously they were under a lot of pressure to keep showing these increases in sales and everything like that. And then the opportunity, I think, is pretty clear already throughout this presentation, but there was a major lack of internal controls. Um, Eddie and Sam could basically do whatever they wanted. Um, and then also the inexperienced auditors and the lack of independence, which Stephen kind of touched on. Um, they didn't really know what they were doing, and Sam just kind of convinced them to do certain things. And then also, they spent a lot of time together, so they clearly weren't independent, which we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then the rationalization, which Greg kind of touched on in the beginning, there was a complete lack of ethics from their very beginning when they started. Just that example of Eddie barricading a customer in a store to make a sale. He valued money, um, profits, and sales above integrity and honesty and everything like that. And then they were just greedy, basically. They had been making a lot of money before they went public. They were skimming a lot of profits, so they wanted to keep making money. Um, so that was definitely a big part of the rationalization was the greed of the whole family. So then I want to talk about the lack of professional skepticism a little bit. Um, I think we may have done a research problem on this, so I know you guys are familiar with it, but I'll go ahead and read it. It's an attitude that includes a questioning mind and critical assessment of audit evidence regardless of any past experience with the entity and regardless of the auditor's belief about management's honesty and integrity. So it's really important when you're considering the risk of material misstatement. 
So you're supposed to conduct the engagement with this questioning mind, and it's pretty clear that the auditors in this case were not doing that. Just one example of that was there was actually two different firms that questioned um, this huge increase in employee pay, and that was caused by they used to pay them mostly in cash, so their checks looked really low. So when they went public, a lot of their employees would show like a 20 times increase in pay because they were maybe only getting $15,000 before, but now they're getting paid sixty. Well, Sam was like, oh, I can handle this. This is no big deal. He literally told the auditors that these like hundreds of people had been working for basically nothing just so that they could be a part of a big public company someday. So it's just kind of ridiculous. Like, just raise your hand if any of you guys would actually accept that explanation if you're an auditor. I hope no one. <laughs> so they definitely were not being questioning at all. Um, they just kind of shoved it over their eyes or whatever. And like I said, both auditing firms, which I just couldn't believe, accepted the explanation and didn't even investigate further. And then also, um, like I talked about, the auditors liked the employees and they trusted them and management. They spent a lot of time together. Um, they didn't want to believe that they were doing something bad because they were basically their friends. And then, um, Brady already talked about the, tax, the tactics that Sam used to distract them with the women and all that. Okay. And then the analytical procedures they were completely lacking in. Um, most of them, in a lot of areas, they didn't even perform these procedures. So you're supposed to perform them with an, an objective of identifying the existence of unusual transactions or events and amounts, ratios, and trends that might indicate financial statement implications. So that's a big part of the fraud. Um, they didn't even examine their bank deposits or statements, which that was a big deal in the Panama pump. Um, Stephen talked about that. They would have definitely found this fraud because the average sale was $300, and they're making big deposits of like 25 grand, 50 grand. So if they would have looked or examined them and done a few tests, they definitely would have found that. And then the negative accounts payable balances should have been a huge red flag. They didn't just have one or two vendors that were showing that the vendors owed them money. They had tons. So if they would have kind of thought, or thought outside the box and realized, hey, this doesn't really make sense, and done some analytical procedures, they might have found that the debit memo was <coughs> And then also one thing I didn't specifically put on here, but Sam also pressured the auditors and used the distractions to make sure they couldn't get their work done. So they didn't get to perform like sales cutoff tests at the end of the year to make sure they weren't shifting sales from one year to the next um, and different things like that. So they were basically cut short on all their analytical procedures and instead of saying, hey, we need more time, they said, okay, because they didn't want to lose the business. And then I just thought this was kind of an interesting thing to include. In their work papers, they, one auditor actually documented that he traced all debit memos into the accounts payable report. I thought there was no further work necessary. And that was a big deal in the court proceedings. They were like, hey, did you write this? Did you say this? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, did you actually audit them on this? No. So he basically just lied. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about um, these ratios. So receivables turnover is the sales divided by the receivables. Um, and that, so I have it, the one ratio over the day is what I want to look at. So basically, uh, according to Dr. Ellison, he said that their receivables turnover really shouldn't change unless they have a different protocol. So if they would have went in 85 and 84, they said, we'll get to 1986 and we're going to make all of our accounts receivable um, have to be paid or have to be paid to us within three days. Then that would make sense. But they didn't have a change in protocol. Everything was the same with how they collected and how they paid. So it didn't really make sense. Um, also, it was mainly a cash business. So you can see in 86 through 84, their accounts receivable was pretty low, which makes sense. They shouldn't be... They should be collecting cash, not, you know, getting notes or different things from people to pay. So it was kind of odd when it jumped all the way up to almost 11000 and And that would have been a big red flag. Um, these dollars are also in millions, by the way. So it didn't really make sense that it jumped all the way when they're mostly a cash business. 
And then another one that was a big deal, especially once they found out about the fraud, was the inventory turnovers. So their sales were increasing, but their inventory turnover wasn't. So if you think about it, if your sales are increasing, that means that you're turning over your inventory more times throughout the year. You're selling your inventory more times if you have more sales. Well, this wasn't happening because of all the inflation of the inventory. So even though their sales were going up, you can see that their inventory turnover um, consistently declined. So that would have been really odd if they might have looked at that and said, wait a second, you're increasing your sales by this much, but you're turning over your inventory less. You know, it's not like they were selling something other than their inventory. So if they would have looked at that, then they might have investigated the inventory further. Okay. And then with the audit evidence, um, some examples that might indicate the risk of fraud would be unusual analytical trends. So they definitely had that, but they didn't analyze anything, so they probably didn't know. But they had inconsistent changes in inventory, accounts payable, sales, and cost of goods sold. And then their comparison to the industry was pretty out of whack, like we talked about. The industry was going down, but they were climbing above everyone, kind of comparable to Enron, how um, they were comparing with their industry. So they were either going down or staying flat, but Crazy Eddie was way up. And then also conflicting or missing audit evidence is a big red flag. So time pressures imposed by management, which is a specific thing they state in the standards, um, and Sam was definitely pressuring them to get things done quickly. So if that was happening to one of us, we might think, like, why are you in such a hurry? You don't want me to find something, but they didn't have that skepticism. Also, there were unusual delays in providing information. Sam would purposefully make sure they couldn't get what they needed to finish their work. And then intimidation by management. Um, there was actually a case, I think it was in 1987, where someone, one of the audit firms, the partner, was actually questioning Sam about some of his financial um, numbers and everything like that. And Sam basically convinced him just to give him, you know, a clean, a clean opinion and just to issue it because it was close to the end of the audit. This was in like April and they issued their opinion like two days later. So we basically intimidated him into getting this um, clean opinion. So yeah, the partner was wanting to reorder the inventory count because he kind of saw this crazy inflation of the inventory. But like I said, Sam basically bullied him into not doing it. And then independence, which is obviously a big topic that we always talk about. So you guys can just go ahead and read that, but basically just that the auditor is supposed to be free from any obligation and appear to be in independent. So a big problem that I don't even think would be allowed today is that they only charge them $85,000 for their audit, which is like completely lowballed everyone else. And then they got millions in consulting services. So that was one of their big revenues that they lost crazy out of their audit. They were definitely going to lose the consulting. They even were actually helping computerize their inventory system. So they were making the system that they were auditing. So it doesn't really make sense, but they definitely weren't independent. And then also, most of the Crazy Eddie accounting staff was former um, audit firm employees. So they knew what to look for, how to hide things. Like I, um, Stephen talked about, they spent a lot of time hanging out with Crazy Eddie staff, just kind of being friends and everything. All right, so we get back to 1987, which is the start of the end for Crazy Eddie. And in August, you have these two, uh, Elias Zinn and Oppenheimer Palmieri Fund begin to take over. This group, or actually the Oppenheimer Palmieri Fund, was known as like a, a turnaround artist. So like I said, 86, the electronics boom ends. Crazy Eddie has a little rough pull in Wall Street. This guy's thinking he's going to come in, take it over, and he's going to turn around and make it great. So, um, August, they come up with their plan. At the same time, Eddie and Sam learn of it. So their first thing is, hey, we need to find a way to take our own company private. So they start searching for investors. Um, turns out, no, investors just didn't want to give them money. Investors weren't ready to back um, Eddie or Sam. And um, that's kind of really the start to the end. Um, in November, it goes through. The hostile takeover happens. The Palm Air Fund takes over Crazy Eddie. Uh, and it was actually, this is what's interesting, is Sam M., which remember isn't the cousin, that's his dad actually, the one that they have this rift between them, he voted in favor of the takeover, um, which you'll learn about here in a little bit, is the fact that 
Um, Sam M. was actually part of the plot to destroy Crazy Eddie. For some reason, he just thought he wasn't going to get involved in the fraud side of it. So, um, the Antar family, once Palmieri Fund took over, the new management came and pretty much wiped out all the Antar family's involvement in Crazy Eddie. And two weeks later, they decided to do an inventory account which reveals fraud. Uh, ended up being over $40 million of inventory that didn't even exist that they had had on, the, on their books. Uh, shortly thereafter, you have several class action lawsuits filed. And very quickly, the investigations begin by the SEC and the FBI both. And so we get into this one, which is the fallout of it. So the investigation is focused on Eddie and Sam and not the entire family. This is really important. Um, what had happened was two employees were sent by their dad, or by uh, Eddie's father, Sam M., to go to the SEC and report this fraud. Their uh, point was they weren't to mention anybody but Eddie and his allies. They were trying to get everybody else out of the fraud. So Eddie and Sam, they got their backs against the wall. They don't know about this at the time. So they think uh, their first thought is to accuse the new management of this false allegation, saying that they completely made this up. It's not true. Um, one of the things that helped them uh, keep these investigations going was, uh, yes, the auditors were creating a new inventory system. Well, when Sam came into the company, he wiped out all the systems they had before. He came in and he switched back to a manual system to do most things. Sales were reported in cash, a lot of them. Things of that effect, records were kept in cash. Uh, he just did all he could to keep things off the books. The auditors, they didn't keep working papers. They were so close in this company, they had so much faith in Crazy Eddie. They would do these inventory checks, and they wouldn't even take documents with them. They'd leave them. What Crazy Eddie gave them was what they had, and uh, they would just start destroying documents throughout the process. Um, and so 1989 finally comes to the point Eddie and Sam realized they're in bad, bad trouble. Um, and Eddie just kind of, Eddie actually tells Sam, Hey, it's best you get away from me, stay away from me, uh, go our separate ways. Eddie, at this point, he'd spent about the past two years transferring all his bonds back overseas to Israel. And then by 1990, the day after he's indicted, he uh, flees to Israel. Sam, he's left to deal with this. He has one half of his family or three quarters of it that absolutely can't stand him or Eddie wants to get him. And then he has Eddie, who's supposed to be his ally, who's just left him stranded. Um, Remember, Sam was mentored by Eddie. He came and worked for his company, so he's left to stand still by himself. So he enters a plea bargain after hiring some new lawyers and uh, starts beginning to cooperate with investigators. Uh, this is where the actual were able to get Sam's right here, or to get Eddie. Sam <coughs> provided the information about these secret accounts in Israel that actually blew up this whole investigation. Because to this point, they were all here say there was no verification. Because like I said, the people who were telling the SEC things we're telling them things that weren't true in the first place. They were only partially correct. Um, and this, Eddie's father, mother, brother, and others, their involvement was discovered, which is where the SEC finally realized that the people they were dealing with weren't really telling them the whole truth. There was a lot more to this fraud than what they were being told. So this is uh, Eddie, is wanted by the U.S. Marshals. It's a nice little photo of him. So then everything kind of came crashing down on everybody. Uh, Eddie was eventually found in uh, Israel, and on the same day, his brother and father were also captured by the FBI. Um, his dad, Sam, actually ended up getting uh, eluded all charges because of a uh, total lack of evidence. All him and his cousins, when they were trying to expose each other, expose Eddie and the other Sam, had destroyed just a bunch of evidence, but he ended up having to pay a bunch of civil charges. Um, when the criminal trial took place, Sam E. Antar, who was the CFO, he was actually the star witness uh, against Eddie and his father, and apparently the uh, trial was much in question because he had been part of the fraud to begin with, so he was very questioned the entire time. And uh, according to the SEC, they never really found a lot of the money, and in all it was over $90 million uh, from the fraud. So where are they now? Uh, Crazy Eddie filed for bankruptcy in 1989. Uh, Eddie ended up having to serve a seven-year prison sentence. Um, he ended up having to pay about $75 million worth of uh, penalties. 
He, they tried again, him and like a couple cousins tried again to make Crazy Eddie, and like they tried to make it like an online business, but that didn't really work. And uh, he uh, resides in Brooklyn now, and apparently from what I saw, there was rumor that he actually had, had cancer, or has cancer. Um, Sam, the cousin, he uh, only received six months of um, six months of house arrest and uh, the community service and a couple fines. Now actually he helps advise the government um, with white collar crime, so it's kind of like the story of Catch Me If You Can, Leonardo DiCaprio's character, being the best at what you do, so then you go and help the government do it. And then uh, Sam Amantar, the father, he ended up um, dying in 2005 with no money, but he ended up having to pay about $15 million in, uh, in penalties. Um, up to that point, this was, uh, you know, it was only $90 million, but up to that point, it was the biggest fraud um, up to Enron. And uh, that's pretty much the insanity that was Crazy Eddie. You guys have any questions? I'm sure they do. <laughs> Scott or Tori, do you have a question? I'm pretty thorough. <laughs> um, you might not know this, but mine's kind of might be difficult. How did Eddie 